Chapter 22 of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hour of the Dragon, Chapter 22 The Road to Acheron. Dawn was just whitening the east when a Mulric drew up his hosts in the mouth of the Valley of Lions. This valley was flanked by low, rolling but steep hills, and the floor pitched upward in a series of irregular natural terraces. On the uppermost of these terraces Conan's army held its position, awaiting the attack. The host that had joined him, marching down from Gunderland, had not been composed exclusively of spearmen. With them had come seven thousand Bassonian archers, and four thousand barons and their retainers of the north and west, swelling the ranks of his cavalry. The pikemen were drawn up in a compact, wedge-shaped formation at the narrow head of the valley. There were nineteen thousand of them, mostly gundermen, though some four thousand were Aquilonians of other provinces. They were flanked on either hand by five thousand Bassonian archers. Behind the ranks of the pikemen the knights sat their steeds motionless, lances raised. Ten thousand knights of Poitain, nine thousand Aquilonians, barons and their retainers. It was a strong position. His flanks could not be turned, for that would mean climbing the steep wooded hills in the teeth of the arrows and swords of the Bassonians. His camp lay directly behind him, in a narrow, steep-walled valley, which was indeed merely a continuation of the Valley of Lions, pitching up at a higher level. He did not fear a surprise from the rear, because the hills behind him were full of refugees and broken men whose loyalty to him was beyond question. But if his position was hard to shake, it was equally hard to escape from. It was a trap as well as a fortress for the defenders, a desperate last stand of men who did not expect to survive unless they were victorious. The only line of retreat possible was through the narrow valley at their rear. Zaltotun mounted a hill on the left side of the valley near the wide mouth. This hill rose higher than the others, and was known as the King's Altar, for a reason long forgotten. Only Zaltotun knew, and his memory dated back three thousand years. He was not alone. His two familiars, silent, hairy, furtive, and dark, were with him, and they bore a young Aquilonian girl, bound hand and foot. They laid her on an ancient stone which was curiously like an altar and which crowned the summit of the hill. For long centuries it had stood there, worn by the elements, until many doubted that it was anything but a curiously shapen natural rock. But what it was and why it stood there, Zaltotun remembered from of old. The familiars went away, with their bent backs like silent gnomes, and Zaltotun stood alone beside the altar, his dark beard blown in the wind overlooking the valley he could see clear back to the winding Shirki, and up into the hills beyond the head of the valley. He could see the gleaming wedge of steel drawn up at the head of the terraces, the burgonets of the archers glinting among the rocks and bushes, the silent knights motionless on their steeds, their pennons flowing above their helmets, their lances rising in a bristling thicket. Looking in the other direction he could see the long serried lines of the Nemedians moving in ranks of shining steel into the mouth of the valley. Behind them the gay pavilions of the lords and knights and the drab tents of the common soldiers stretched back almost to the river. Like a river of molten steel the Nemedian host flowed into the valley, the great scarlet dragon rippling over it. First marched the bowmen, in even ranks, arbalests half-raised, bolts knocked, fingers on triggers. After them came the pikemen, and behind them the real strength of the army, the mounted knights, their banners unfurled to the wind, their lances lifted, walking their great steeds forward as if they rode to a banquet. And higher up the slopes the smaller Aquilonian host stood grimly silent. There were thirty thousand Nemedian knights, and, as in most Hyborian nations, it was the chivalry which was the sword of the army. The footmen were used only to clear the way for a charge of the armored knights. There were twenty-one thousand of these, pikemen and archers. 
the bowmen began loosing as they advanced, without breaking ranks, launching their quarrels with a whirr and tang. But the bolts fell short or rattled harmlessly from the overlapping shields of the gundermen. And before the arbalesters could come within killing range, the arching shafts of the Bassonians were wreaking havoc in their ranks. A little of this, a futile attempt at exchanging fire, and the Nemedian bowmen began falling back in disorder. Their armor was light, their weapons no match for the Bassonian longbows. The western archers were sheltered by bushes and rocks. Moreover, the Nemedian footmen lacked something of the morale of the horsemen, knowing as they did that they were being used merely to clear the way for the knights. The crossbowmen fell back, and between their opening lines the pikemen advanced. These were largely mercenaries, and their masters had no compunction about sacrificing them. They were intended to mask the advance of the knights until the latter were within smiting distance. So while the arbalesters plied their bolts from either flank at long range, the pikemen marched into the teeth of the blast from above, and behind them the knights came on. When the pikemen began to falter beneath the savage hail of death that whistled down the slopes among them, a trumpet blew, their companies divided to right and left, and through them the mailed knights thundered. They ran full into a cloud of stinging death. The cloth-yard shafts found every crevice in their armor and the housings of the steeds. Horses scrambling up the grassy terraces reared and plunged backward, bearing their riders with them. Steel-clad forms littered the slopes. The charge wavered and ebbed back. Back down in the valley, a Mulric reformed his ranks. Taraskus was fighting with drawn sword under the Scarlet Dragon, but it was the Baron of Tor who commanded that day. A Mulric swore as he glanced at the forest of lance-tips visible above and beyond the headpieces of the Gundermen. He had hoped his retirement would draw the knights out in a charge down the slopes after him, to be raked from either flank by his bowmen and swamped by the numbers of his horsemen. But they had not moved. Camp servants brought skins of water from the river. Knights doffed their helmets and drenched their sweating heads. The wounded on the slopes screamed vainly for water. In the upper valley, springs supplied the defenders. They did not thirst that long, hot spring day. On the king's altar, beside the ancient carven stone, Zaltotun watched the steel tide ebb and flow. On came the knights, with waving plumes and dipping lances. Through a whistling cloud of arrows they plowed to break like a thundering wave on the bristling wall of spears and shields. Axes rose and fell above the plumed helmets, spears thrust upward, bringing down horses and riders. The pride of the gundermen was no less fierce than that of the knights. They were not spear fodder to be sacrificed for the glory of better men. They were the finest infantry in the world, with a tradition that made their morale unshakable. The kings of Aquilonia had long learned the worth of unbreakable infantry. They held their formation unshaken. Over their gleaming ranks flowed the great lion banner and at the tip of the wedge a giant figure in black armor roared and smote like a hurricane, with a dripping axe that split steel and bone alike. The Nemedians fought as gallantly as their traditions of high courage commanded, but they could not break the iron wedge, and from the wooded knolls on either hand arrows raked their close-packed ranks mercilessly. Their own bowmen were useless, their pikemen unable to climb the heights and come to grips with the Bassonians. Slowly, stubbornly, sullenly, the grim knights fell back, counting their empty saddles. Above them the gundermen made no outcry of triumph. They closed their ranks, locking up the gaps made by the fallen. Sweat ran into their eyes from under their steel caps. They gripped their spears and waited, their fierce hearts swelling with pride that a king should fight on foot with them. Behind them the Aquilonian knights had not moved. They sat their steeds, grimly immobile. A knight spurred a sweating horse up the hill called the King's Altar, and glared at Zaltotun with bitter eyes. "'Amalric bids me say that it is time to use your magic, wizard,' he said. "'We are dying like flies down there in the valley. 
We cannot break their ranks. Zaltotun seemed to expand, to grow tall and awesome and terrible. Return to Amalric, he said. Tell him to reform his ranks for a charge, but to await my signal. Before that signal is given, he will see a sight that he will remember until he lies dying. The knight saluted as if compelled against his will, and thundered down the hill at breakneck pace. Zaltotun stood beside the dark altar stone and stared across the valley, at the dead and wounded men on the terraces, at the grim, blood stained band at the head of the slopes, at the dusty, steel clad ranks reforming in the vale below. He glanced up at the sky, and he glanced down at the slim white figure on the dark stone. And, lifting a dagger inlaid with archaic hieroglyphs, he intoned an immemorial invocation. Set, God of darkness, scaly lord of the shadows, by the blood of a virgin and the sevenfold symbol, I call to your sons below the black earth. Children of the deeps, Below the red earth, under the black earth, awaken and shake your awful manes. Let the hills rock and the stones topple upon my enemies. Let the sky grow dark above them, the earth unstable beneath their feet. Let a wind from the deep black earth curl up beneath their feet and blacken and shrivel them. He halted short, dagger lifted. In the tense silence the roar of the host rose beneath him, borne on the wind. On the other side of the altar stood a man in a black hooded robe, whose coif shadowed pale delicate features and dark eyes calm and meditative. "'Dog of Asura!' whispered Zeltotun, his voice was like the hiss of an angered serpent. "'Are you mad that you seek your doom? Ho, oh, Baal! Chiron!' Call again, dog of Asheron, said the other, and laughed. Summon them loudly. They will not hear, unless your shouts reverberate in hell. From a thicket on the edge of the crest came a somber old woman in peasant garb, her hair flowing over her shoulders, a great gray wolf following at her heels. Witch, priest, and wolf, muttered Zeltotun grimly, and laughed. Fools! to pit your charlatan's mummery against my arts. With a wave of my hand, I brush you from my path. Your arts are straws in the wind, dog of Python, answered the Assyrian. Have you wondered why the Shirki did not come down in flood and trap Conan on the other bank? When I saw the lightning in the night, I guessed your plan, and my spells dispersed the clouds you had summoned before they could empty their torrents. You did not even know that your rain-making wizardry had failed. "'You lie!' cried Zaltotun, but the confidence in his voice was shaken. "'I have felt the impact of a powerful sorcery against mine, but no man on earth could undo the rain-magic, once made, unless he possessed the very heart of sorcery.' "'But the flood you plotted did not come to pass,' answered the priest. Look at your allies in the valley, Pythonian. You have led them to the slaughter. They are caught in the fangs of the trap, and you cannot aid them. Look!" He pointed. Out of the narrow gorge of the upper valley, behind the Poitanians, a horseman came flying, whirling, something about his head that flashed in the sun. Recklessly he hurtled down the slopes, through the ranks of the gundermen who sent up a deep-throated roar and clashed their spears and shields like thunder in the hills. On the terraces between the hosts the sweat-soaked horse reared and plunged, and his wild rider yelled and brandished the thing in his hands like one demented. It was the torn remnant of a scarlet banner, and the sun struck dazzlingly on the golden scales of a serpent that writhed thereon. Valerius is dead, cried Hadrathus ringingly. A fog and a drum lured him to his doom. I gathered that fog, dog of Python, and I dispersed it. I with my magic, which is greater than your magic. What matters it? roared Zeltotun, a terrible sight, 
his eyes blazing, his features convulsed. Valerius was a fool. I do not need him. I can crush Conan without human aid. Why have you delayed? mocked Hadrathus. Why have you allowed so many of your allies to fall pierced by arrows and spitted on spears? Because blood aids great sorcery, thundered Zelto Toon in a voice that made the rocks quiver. A lurid nimbus played about his awful head. Because no wizard wastes his strength thoughtlessly. Because I would conserve my powers for the great days to be, rather than employ them in a hill country brawl. But now, by set, I shall loose them to the uttermost. Watch, dog of Asura, false priest of an outworn god, and see a sight that shall blast your reason for evermore. Hadrathus threw back his head and laughed, and hell was in his laughter. Look, black devil of Python! His hand came from under his robe, holding something that flamed and burned in the sun, changing the light to a pulsing golden glow in which the flesh of Zalto Tun looked like the flesh of a corpse. Zalto Tun cried out as if he had been stabbed. The heart! The heart of Ahriman! I, the one power that is greater than your power! Zaltotun seemed to shrivel, to grow old. Suddenly his beard was shot with snow, his locks flecked with gray. The heart, he mumbled, you stole it, dog, thief! Not I. It has been on a long journey far to the southward. But now it is in my hands, and your black arts cannot stand against it. As it resurrected you, so shall it hurl you back into the night whence it drew you. You shall go down the dark road to Acheron, which is the road of silence and the night. The dark empire, unreborn, shall remain a legend and a black memory. Conan shall reign again, and the heart of Ahriman shall go back into the cavern below the temple of Mitra, to burn as a symbol of the power of Aquilonia for a thousand years. Zaltotun screamed inhumanly and rushed around the altar, dagger lifted. But from somewhere, out of the sky perhaps, or the great jewel that blazed in the hand of Hadrathus, shot a jetting beam of blinding blue light. Full against the breast of Zaltotun it flashed, and the hills re-echoed the concussion. The wizard of Acheron went down as though struck by a thunderbolt, and before he touched the ground he was fearfully altered. Beside the altar stone lay no fresh slain corpse, but a shriveled mummy, a brown, dry, unrecognizable carcass sprawling among moldering swathings. Somberly, old Zaleta looked down. He was not a living man, she said. The heart lent him a false aspect of life that deceived even himself. I never saw him as other than a mummy. Hadrathus bent to unbind the swooning girl on the altar, when from among the trees appeared a strange apparition, Zaltotun's chariot drawn by the weird horses. Silently they advanced to the altar and halted, with the chariot wheel almost touching the brown withered thing on the grass. Hadrathus lifted the body of the wizard and placed it in the chariot, and without hesitation the uncanny steeds turned and moved off southward, down the hill. And Hadrathus and Zaleta and the Grey Wolf watched them go, down the long road to Acheron, which is beyond the ken of men. Down in the valley, Amalric had stiffened in his saddle when he saw that wild horseman curvetting and caracoling on the slopes while he brandished that blood-stained serpent banner. Then some instinct jerked his head about, toward the hill known as the King's Altar. And his lips parted. Every man in the valley saw it, an arching shaft of dazzling light that towered up from the summit of the hill, showering golden fire. High above the host it burst in a blinding blaze that momentarily paled the sun. "'That's not Zaltotun's signal!' roared the baron. "'No!' shouted Taraskus. 
It's a signal to the Aquilonians. Look! Above them, the immobile ranks were moving at last, and a deep-throated roar thundered across the vale. Zaltotun has failed us! bellowed Amalric furiously. Valerius has failed us! We have been led into a trap! Mitras curse on Zaltotun, who led us here! Sound the retreat! Too late! yelled Tarascus. Look! Up on the slopes, the forest of lances dipped, leveled. The ranks of the gundermen rolled back to the right and left like a parting rain, and with a thunder like the rising roar of a hurricane the knights of Aquilonia crashed down the slopes. The impetus of that charge was irresistible. Bolts driven by the demoralized arbalesters glanced from their shields, their bent helmets. Their plumes and pennants streaming out behind them, their lances lowered, they swept over the wavering lines of pikemen and roared down the slopes like a wave. Amalric yelled an order to charge, and the Nemedians with desperate courage spurred their horses at the slopes. They still outnumbered the attackers. But they were weary men on tired horses, charging uphill. The onrushing knights had not struck a blow that day. Their horses were fresh. They were coming downhill, and they came like a thunderbolt. And like a thunderbolt, they smote the struggling ranks of the Nemedians, smote them, split them apart, ripped them asunder, and dashed the remnants headlong down the slopes. After them, on foot, came the Gundermen, blood-mad, and the Bassonians were swarming down the hills, loosing as they ran at every foe that still moved. Down the slopes washed the tide of battle the day's Nemedians swept on the crest of the wave. Their archers had thrown down their arbalests and were fleeing. Such pikemen as had survived the blasting charge of the knights were cut to pieces by the ruthless gundermen. In a wild confusion the battle swept through the wide mouth of the valley and into the plain beyond. All over the plain swarmed the warriors, fleeing and pursuing, broken into single combat and clumps of smiting, hacking knights on rearing, wheeling horses. But the Nemedians were smashed, broken, unable to reform or make a stand. By the hundreds they broke away, spurring for the river. Many reached it, rushed across, and rode eastward. The countryside was up behind them, the people hunted them like wolves. Few ever reached Tarantia. The final break did not come until the fall of Amalric. The baron, striving in vain to rally his men, rode straight at the clump of knights that followed the giant in black armor, whose surcoat bore the royal lion, and over whose head floated the golden lion banner with the scarlet leopard of Poitain beside it. A tall warrior in gleaming armor couched his lance and charged to meet the lord of Tor. They met like a thunderclap. The Nemedian's lance, striking his foe's helmet, snapped bolts and rivets and tore off the cask, revealing the features of Palantides. But the Aquilonian's lance-head crashed through shield and breastplate to transfix the baron's heart. A roar went up as Amalric was hurled from his saddle, snapping the lance that impaled him, and the Nemedians gave way as a barrier bursts under the surging impact of a tidal wave. They rode for the river in a blind stampede that swept the plain like a whirlwind. The hour of the dragon had passed. Tarascus did not flee. Amalric was dead, the color-bearer slain, and the royal Nemedian banner trampled in the blood and dust. Most of his knights were fleeing, and the Aquilonians were riding them down. Tarascus knew the day was lost but with a handful of faithful followers he raged through the melee, conscious of but one desire, to meet Conan the Cimmerian. And at last he met him. Formations had been destroyed utterly, close-knit bands broken asunder and swept apart. The crest of Trocero gleamed in one part of the plain, those of Prospero and Palantides in others. Conan was alone. The house troops of Tarascus had fallen one by one. The two kings met man to man. Even as they rode at each other, the horse of Tarascus sobbed and sank under him. Conan leapt from his own steed and ran at him, as the king of Nemedia disengaged himself and rose. 
Steel flashed blindingly in the sun, clashed loudly, and blue sparks flew. Then a clang of armor as Tarascus measured his full length on the earth beneath a thunderous stroke of Conan's broadsword. The Cimmerian placed a mail-shod foot on his enemy's breast and lifted his sword. His helmet was gone. He shook back his black mane, and his blue eyes blazed with their old fire. "'Do you yield?' "'Will you give me quarter?' demanded the Nemedian. "'Aye, better than you'd have given me, you dog. Life for you and all your men who throw down their arms. Though I ought to split your head for an infernal thief,' the Cimmerian added. Tarascus twisted his neck and glared over the plain. The remnants of the Nemedian host were flying across the stone bridge with swarms of victorious Aquilonians at their heels smiting with fury of glutted vengeance. Bassonians and Gundermen were swarming through the camp of their enemies, tearing the tents to pieces in search of plunder, seizing prisoners, ripping open the baggage, and upsetting the wagons. Tarascus cursed fervently, and then shrugged his shoulders, as well as he could, under the circumstances. "'Very well. I have no choice. What are your demands?' Surrender to me all your present holdings in Aquilonia. Order your garrisons to march out of the castles and towns they hold without their arms, and get your infernal armies out of Aquilonia as quickly as possible. In addition, you shall return all Aquilonians sold as slaves, and pay an indemnity to be designated later, when the damage your occupation of the country has caused has been properly estimated." You will remain as hostage until these terms have been carried out. Very well, surrendered Tarascus. I will surrender all the castles and towns now held by my garrisons without resistance, and all the other things shall be done. What ransom for my body! Conan laughed and removed his foot from his foe's steel-clad breast, grasped his shoulder, and heaved him to his feet. He started to speak then turned to see Hadrathus approaching him. The priest was as calm and self-possessed as ever, picking his way between rows of dead men and horses. Conan wiped the sweat-smeared dust from his face with a blood-stained hand. He had fought all through the day, first on foot with the pikemen, then in the saddle leading the charge. His surcoat was gone, his armor splashed with blood and battered with strokes of sword, mace, and axe. He loomed gigantically against a background of blood and slaughter, like some grim pagan hero of mythology. "'Well done, Hadrathus,' quoth he gustily. "'By crumb, I'm glad to see your signal. My knights were almost mad with impatience and eating their hearts out to be at sword-strokes. I could not have held them much longer. What of the wizard?' "'He has gone down the dim road to Acheron answered Hadrathus, and I, I am for Terentia. My work is done here, and I have a task to perform at the temple of Mitra. All our work is done here. On this field we have saved Aquilonia, and more than Aquilonia. Your ride to your capital will be a triumphal procession through a kingdom mad with joy. All Aquilonia will be cheering the return of their king." And so, until we meet again in the great royal hall, farewell. Conan stood silently watching the priest as he went. From various parts of the field knights were hurrying toward him. He saw Palantides, Trocero, Prospero, Servius Galanus, their armor splashed with crimson. The thunder of the battle was giving way to a roar of triumph and acclaim. All eyes— hot with strife and shining with exultation, were turned toward the great black figure of the king, mailed arms brandished red-stained swords. A confused torrent of sound rose, deep and thunderous as the sea-surf. Hail, Conan, king of Aquilonia! Tarascus spoke. You have not yet named my ransom. Conan laughed and slapped his sword home in its scabbard. He flecked his mighty arms and ran his blood-stained fingers through his thick black locks, as if feeling there his re-won crown. 
There is a girl in your seraglio named Zenobia. Why, yes, so there is. Very well. The king smiled as at an exceedingly pleasant memory. She shall be your ransom, and naught else. I will come to Belveris for her, as I promised. She was a slave in Nemedia, but I will make her queen of Aquilonia. The End of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard <laughs>